my name is Linda Nurk and I'm a designer. I've been working within the fashion industry for about over 20 years. Um, I started off, I'm originally from Sweden, uh, Estonian heritage. Studied in Paris and worked uh, many, many years in Paris in the couture houses. And later on, when I moved back to Sweden, um, I've been mostly freelancing, but I worked basically from doing evening gowns to sportwear, uh, very wide and broad experience. So this journey with bio design and creating my own material started a couple of years ago when uh, I was lecturing at Beckman's Design School here in Stockholm and all the students asked me, well, how do we implement the sustainability and this whole circularity in our work? And I think it's really, every designer has to find their own journey and their own answers to that. And um, that led me back to my own practice. Um, so basically I'm researching innovative ways of working with biomaterials. And especially the last uh, two years now, I've been um, almost obsessive about silk. And I found silk is really like a wonderful natural material that's been shamed a lot in the fashion industry for a while, but it's also been I mean, sil silk is silk. Uh, silk is um, um, kind of a material that still can't compare to anything else when you come to the clothing industry. And um, so I've been studying the silkworms and um, how it's eating all until it's almost burst. And I, I do have my own little urban silk farm as well. So I'm very connected to them. And I, I find them like my closest collaborators, but I, I do want to, I do care about their lives somehow that it's a give and take. Like I have to give them a nice life and they can give me silk. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a um, trying to not put myself as a human in the center, even though I'm using them for creating this silk. I see it as a highly like a collaborative process, but most of all, it's like a research process and a conversation with the fashion industry and with arts and craft, what you can actually do with traditional materials. So I'm very inspired how it, it's eating until it almost burst and uh, it's way of just releasing all that energy in order to grow its like wearable protection, which is the cocoon and how it transforms itself by preparation to a new state. So I see how this really links to like human desire for self-realization and a new style. And sometimes it's like simply superficial and sometimes at other times it's for pure survival. So through the development of growing my own textiles and this urban micro farming that I am practicing, I have found a kind of path towards a wild mix of biodegradable methods in body sculpted uh, textiles. I come to call this method Couture Vivant because I needed a name for it. I, I was like experimenting with new materials. I started off with biocellulose and uh, like kind of kombucha leather. And then I was trying out bioplastics and then I got in, more into silk. And what I'm actually doing with the silk is um, that I let the silkworms, when they're ready, ready to start spinning, Instead of spinning themselves into cocoons, I have then molded different shapes, like for instance, the torso of a body. And then I lay all the silkworms on top of the body and um, they kind of looking for two anchor points like they would do if they were in a tree. And if they can't find these two anchor points, they just start spinning. So they actually spin on this flat surface. And I worked a lot with embellishment and natural waste. So I um, carefully lay out petals of flowers to make my own kind of intarsia weave, I will call it. And um, they actually embed the flowers for me whilst they're walking across the surface. And the fantastic thing with silkworms is like when they reach the edge, they can't hear very well and they can't like see very well. So they have this kind of tentacles and they feel like there's nothing there and they don't wanna dive down into uh, something unknown so they just walk towards the edge and then they walk back and by nature they're just doing this magical hem 
that you can't believe. It's just so exquisite. It's like perfect. <laughs> and I think just these kind of things that you discover when you work with them is like, I mean, it's it's really like uh, kind of an ecstatic feeling. My project for the moment is to try to build a kind of wearable ecosystem. So you, if you think about it like um, a kind of a varium and I will have then um, silkworms creating this fabric during the process of wearing it. It's a kind of a self-sustained biodegradable design production and living its own ecosystem and material growth that's um, naturally forming its own ecosystem and where a creation and waste lives in symbiosis with the wearer. So this is what I'm trying to research for the moment. My name is Natsai Audrey Chiesa and I am the founder of Faber Futures. Um, Faber Futures is a, a design agency that's really working at the intersection of biotechnology and society. So we are through our practice asking fundamental questions about the kinds of relationships we, we, we wish to have with nature and especially as they are increasingly being mediated by emerging biotechnologies. Um, so um, can we start to create a values driven approach to how we um, develop these technologies and infrastructures um, and and the the outputs um, uh, to what extent can uh, the outputs be um, better for the environment, um, better for human flourishing, uh, I think is, is such an, an important aspect of, of that. Um, and then what does it take to to start to design um, our biotechnological futures with equity in mind, uh, with solidarity in mind, with sustainability in mind. My background uh, is in uh, architectural design. I studied architecture at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I did my part one there and I learned a lot about um, the multi-stakeholder nature of design that it isn't actually uh, despite what the star architects uh, would make us believe it's not about an individual um, making a, a vision happen and that you have to uh, work alongside society to bring about that vision and that vision is not neutral um, what was fascinating for me at the time was um, stepping back from this for the from the more conceptual and structural to really get into the material and the side of it uh, so at the time when I was studying in Edinburgh, I was fascinated by fashion and how the scale of fashion enabled you to iterate on the idea quickly. Um, and so after sort of applying to various fashion schools, um, none would have me. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I couldn't bear the idea of um, having done four years of um, very rigorous architectural studies um, to, to start at foundation level at, for, for fashion. I decided instead to do a master's in material futures. At the time it was called textile futures at Central St. Martins. And what was fascinating about textile futures was the invitation that as a student, um, you could explore the, 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 the cultural uh, elements, the craft elements of, of, of a material space and define for yourself what your brief was. And um, that's where I met Carol Collet. She was my course director. And at the time, uh, she was almost in this amazing moment of transition from um, textiles and the digital realm uh, being a, a core focus of research to textile and the biological realm. And so coming from architecture, I understood um, how the digital side of uh, textile innovation um, could bring forwards new ways of thinking about materiality and building infrastructures. Um, but biology, that was like, whoa, that's nuts. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Carol collaborated um, on a project with Nobel scientists uh, looking at synthetic biology and asking fundamental questions about what that meant for design and that intrigued me. Um, and so very quickly my work uh, as a student segued into this um, world of the biotech. Uh, what, is, what does it mean that scientists are designing and redesigning nature from, from the ground up? What does that mean for design on a fundamental basis? Um, what skills should a designer have in a future where uh, we have biological designers or bio designers? Um, and so my practice um, started to really contend with these um, more speculative questions, um, but I quickly realized that actually I wanted to be in the lab um, because the lab seemed at the time to be where that work, that innovation was happening. 
Um, and so I uh, connected with uh, Professor John Ward, um, who uh, was a professor of synthetic biology uh, and head of uh, department um, at University College uh, London's uh, biochemical engineering uh, department. Um, and he very generously um, enabled uh, the start, I think, of my um, sort of hands-on research with biological living systems. Um, he introduced me to a, a microbe that produced pigment. And I think because I was coming from that textile world, I saw an immediate connection there. Um, could, could we extract that pigment and turn it into a system for dyeing textiles? Um, and it took a year to realize that the word extract is not the right word if you're going to actually fundamentally um, approach this in a new way. Instead, now we use words like um, co-culturing um, or phrases like co-culturing because actually you don't extract the, the pigment because it's never going to be the, the high enough yield and it's going to drop into an existing system that's arguably broken. What you want to think about is, can you grow bacteria with textiles? And what are the fundamental implications of that? Then you can start talking about crafting with the living. Then you can start talking about different time frames for things. And I think that's part of what this conversation is about, is can we embed notions of care with how we um, develop textiles? Uh, and, and I think that's really, for me, where that journey became to where we are now. Um, I was working on this since 2011, so it's been a decade. And in that time, we've seen an industry um, really emerge from being nascent to, you know, quite big companies becoming public now in the synthetic biology sphere. And what I recognized um, quite early on was that there was a disconnect between uh, the design thinking that myself and others in the community have been developing um, and the marketization, if you like, the commercial aspects of synthetic biology. Uh, and what we're asking is, can we create a bridge? It's been a journey and I think we're right at the start. Um, so this is a great time to be asking these questions about how do we frame uh, our biotechnological futures and in relation to the kinds of relationship we wish to have with nature. What if we scale to such an extent that um, the same behaviors that drive uh, fast fashion consumption today persist? Have we not just offset it, um, the use of uh, petroleum-based material and mm. the extractive processes there to the biological realm, which mm. is you know, just as dangerous, if not so more, um, if we're not cognizant of the fact that if you're fermenting something potentially you're using sugar, sugar comes from the land. Yeah. And as a textile maker, suddenly you're implicated in land use and land yeah. politics. Uh, yeah. And who in the fashion industry is thinking about land politics mm -hmm. when they're drawing you know, their, their, their uh, next collection? And so a uh, very long-winded way of, of maybe asking you the question around scale. Mm -hmm. What are the tensions with what you're doing um, for these incredible, exquisite garments to be to, to, to find homes, um, people who love them, who want to cherish them, who want to, um, to support this, this, this way of thinking and making, um, where does it become accessible? Mm. Where are the tensions for you in that? I to what extent, and maybe uh, one final question, to what extent is the organism answering that question for us, right? Um. Well, your first kind of question, like where does it become accessible? And it's something that I find it also very uh, interesting that now i am been moving towards more craft because I can really see that what I do, it takes time and I can't even follow a production pace. And then also because of my background that I was I was making evening gowns and something can take like 200 hours to hand sew. And if you have an order, it can take maybe three months. I could actually grow this uh, gown in three months, knowing exactly where it comes from and exactly where it goes. Um, not then talking about like involving sugar and landfill, but I, I could actually have create from waste material, whatever it is. Um, I, I find it very, Difficult also, 
I started off being very interested in bio design, but then I think I moved more towards craft where I am now, where I'm trying to um, mix kind of bio design and craft just because of the fact that I found that the bio design industry is just interested in like having the next big company taking over the whole world <laughs> a little bit. Like it's just going to be a shift into what you just talked about but it's it's um everybody's just interested in going up in mass scaling or like mass producing all the time and i think that the conversation has to really be different we, we can't mass produce are we really interested in mass producing but do we really have to do we always really have to have the industry doing it for us as well is my question can we can we like push society towards more of a that you buy a base and you actually create the garment yourself with dye or does it have to be a finished product we buy i i, I really understand what you're saying here yes where is that dialogue um within fashion to 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 not just see people as consumers but as co-creators I think the challenge is what kind of an industry, how does the industry need to reconfigure itself for mm -hmm. the craft approach to be, um, to be included? Um, and it's, it's, it's such a tension because um, when we have these conversations, we have to recognize that um, the vast majority of people on this planet cannot buy into uh, the, the rarefied, uh, the craft production because the markets have shifted away from that, mm. where craft used to be the modus operandi for people creating their own clothes with their own textile market, globalization completely changed that. Mm. Um, so, so I, and this is, I think, and especially since I, I, I sort of came through that academic um, way of thinking about this with, with Project City Color, mm -hmm around scale, which was, why do we have to scale for the big guys? <laughs> and and it's it's clear to me that there are, there are reasons why that has to happen. Mm. But what we can't do is um, negate the possibility of the and, and it's within that space that we can start to challenge the models perhaps, um, mm. that start to govern uh, how we scale um, Biodesign, as an example, but I also want to caveat that to say biodesign is not a monolith. You are working with silkworms, which which are a completely different organism and class of organism to bacterium. The particular bacterium that I'm working with, uh, the conditions for growth are fundamentally different. Yield, uh, time scales, um, variables, apples and oranges. So so your a uh, notion of scale relative to my notion of scale might be at complete odds with one another, hmm. potentially, right, for, for that. So, so, so the question isn't, therefore, it's not part of the conversation. It's what can we build where that's really cool? <laughs> and that is an opportunity for us to tell a different story about what fashion can be. Um, and, and I think that's the space that we try to occupy at Baby Futures is, is exactly that, uh, you know, can biodesign be crafted? And if it is crafted, then what's the business model? Mm. Um, if it is crafted, what infrastructure do you need to be able to, um, to, to make it work in your, in your home relative mm. to the infrastructure I might need? I need sterility. Well, I think that it's perhaps not the scale that is the problem after all. It's it's the fastness, isn't it? Mm. Because when we're talking about how can craft get implemented into uh, by design or uh, into into a way of living, um, it is talking about um, what you just said. You have to start um, refiguring what kind of environment you're in. Um, as well with the silkworms, I need I need a certain temperature. I need to. It needs to also be very clean. It can't be. Um, and there's there's so many factors in order for it to actually work. And if you're gonna implement craft into this, it takes time. But also, you need to uh, redo your home a little bit, or you need to adjust to a way of actually uh, producing something new. And I think that 
part of the power in craft is that uh, it's something that everybody can learn and something that everybody can do in um, in their homes or in the countries or wherever it is. It's it's actually it doesn't have to be produced in one part of the world and then have to be consumed in another part of the world. I think that if the craft, the context of craft is actually to spread it all out to spread out the production or to spread out the making and to spread out the what's coming out of it, to spread out the time. Mm -hmm. it, it's all this of just like kind of taking down the tempo and re-evaluating what life is and live accordingly. So I think the importance of craft of um, can it heal, uh, can materials heal and so on, I think absolutely but it needs a shift. And I think that if just every big industry, even if they scale up, if they started to implement the importance of what craft actually is and means in the kind of a business theory, it, it could absolutely make a big shift. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that you can implement craft in kind of any industry actually. And the mix of craft and bio design is like super exciting because there you have the old knowledge, the nature that heals itself, and also the act of the humans, mm -hmm. which is very important that you, everybody, like you said, and I, I can feel with that as well, when you start questioning why it's important what you're doing, what kind of meaning does it have? Everybody's looking for that kind of meaning. So I think that in that context, craft can like cover all those uh, social, human and industrial needs. This is the actually, the design's purpose is to find solutions. And when we're talking again about textile industry, well, the design has not found solutions, it's just created problems. And uh, I think that this, um, this new industry and the way you work, it has to be solution driven. And then you can present it in a way of a more artistic approach and have um, the art is to question things and to, to create the conversation. And I think that I find myself somewhere in between. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna um, fight hard to upscale what I do. Um, I, I do have a vision of, it's going to be fully possible to create a kind of growing fashion house. Mm -hmm. I mean, my vision is to have a greenhouse that is actually just growing clothes. A designer's purpose is very much just to create the conversation and to create the possibilities, not maybe find the solutions of the upscaling or mass production because it takes time, as we talked about. It, it's, it's a slow process. Um, it's very much of just showing that it is possible. And if it's possible in a small scale, a DIY way of doing it, if I can do it myself, if I, if I can create materials myself on my own uh, that people can wear, then obviously it must be possible to upscale. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to push back on that because <laughs> um, I, I think I used to think that before I saw the opportunity that you can actually, as a designer, start to talk about infrastructure. And that mm -hmm. design has a role there. Uh, what infrastructure do we need to see to facilitate more makers is going to be one step towards a different version of scale up. Uh, and, and, and so one of the things that um, I tell a lot of students when we inter interface with, um, with the educational sector, and especially when so few of them have access to the infrastructure for growing things, mm. growing complex, more complex, complex organ well, le not necessarily complex organisms, but organisms that perhaps have slightly more complex needs. Mm. Um, you know, graphic designers saying, this bio design thing is really interesting, but I don't know how I can contribute with my skill set. Uh, to this. Um, when we look at the system, when we look at the ecosystem even of biotechnology, the 
opportunity for design to come in at different parts of that is huge. So we've just been doing a project at the World Economic Forum um, as part of the Global Futures Council uh, on Synthetic Biology. We're a cohort um, of uh, experts from around the world who are bringing in their insights to basically create um, recommendations for how governments, nations, uh, research institutes should be thinking about synthetic biology in the next um, decades to come uh, and, and framing their policy. Um, now on that council uh, of academics, um, business leaders, um, uh, you know, all sorts of people, um, community engage engagement um, uh, personnel, uh, we are the only designers sitting on the council mm. and the contribution we've made to how people are thinking about how we talk about you know the language the narratives um even the values that you can start to embed um it, and how we not just offer our opinion but demonstrate through strategic work with the council how you can actually design for specific outcomes Mm -hmm. um, is a is a masterclass for anyone on that council who thought that design is I quote my mom uh, making curtains. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't think that anymore, but you you know what I mean. Um, people don't understand the value of of design to know how to leverage it for it to be part of um, how we tackle some of the 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 things that we were never taught at school. We could we could tackle mm. um and, and that's for me the the rallying call for us to reconsider what design is for mm. what design does um some of the work we do is literally to figure out how to build new contracts because it's in the contract that the promise is made and upheld so before you even embark on the collaboration um, if you are interested in an equitable biotechnology, what does the contract say? So for me, it's, um, it's, the, it's, it's like, how do we add to our um, repertoire from the toolkits that we have? And different people will find where their efforts and, and um, work and expertise can contribute to um, mm -hmm. the most from, from that perspective.